As photographers, we all love gadgets and gear. And with the holidays just around the corner, we thought we'd share a few of our favorites with you. Hi guys, and welcome back to the Bird Photography Show. This episode is sponsored by LensCoat, who have some awesome products that we're gonna talk about in just a few minutes. And be sure to stay tuned to the end of this video because LensCoat is giving away a $150 gift card. So make sure to watch till the end where we let you know what you need to do to win that gift card. And also make sure to check out the link to LensCoat's website where they have tons of great sales and gift ideas for the holiday season. So let's get right into some of these great gadgets. We all love little gadgets that just make our lives easier, more comfortable in the field. And the first thing that I've brought for us, which is pertinent because I was just in Antarctica, are these little USB powered hand warmers. They're magnet together, they charge with USB-C, which is great, and these babies get hot. <laughs> these are an awesome accessory to have if you live anywhere cold and you're out shooting. And I'm sure any photographer that you know would really appreciate a pair of these. These are just from Amazon and they're 30, $40, something like that. That sounds pretty cool. And another gadget that every photographer could use is some sort of multi-tool. I have a few little ones here. This one is from Small Rick. It's like a little knife. It's lots of little screws and little things. You can tighten things on your tripod or camera, or you can go ahead and get one of those bigger Leatherman tools. I think that's also something I think everyone needs and a great tool. And it comes in very different price ranges, probably from 20 bucks for something like this, all the way to I don't know, a few hundred dollars for like a proper crazy Leatherman. And that's a great gift too, because even if it's not the specific like photography thing, everybody who likes to be outdoors or even to have in their vehicle or whatever, it's such a handy thing to have. So that's a great gift idea. Another great universal gift idea that I think everybody should have is a really good headlamp and also a really good flashlight. I've used these ones from Phoenix for a long time. Both of these power are charged again with USB-C. Super bright, lasts forever, great batteries. These would make absolutely great gifts. I definitely would be happy if you gifted me those right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Glenn, there's one thing that you have that I don't have, but I would definitely want someone to gift me and that's a USB-C power bank. Absolutely, a decent sized USB-C power bank, I think is a fantastic thing to have and would be another great gift. I know you travel a lot on airplanes, Glenn, and I think there's some fantastic gift ideas in there for photographers who actually want and need to protect their gear when traveling. Yeah, I mean, one of the challenges we always have is fitting all of our stuff into our backpack, which has obviously certain size and weight restrictions, but we know we're never <laughs> gonna meet those. But the size restrictions, you have to fit it in a size. And one of the tips that I've found super helpful is to take all of the dividers out of your backpack or your rolling bag or whatever. And I have fallen in love with these lens pouches from lens coat. So this is one for, or this is a camera one. This is the one that my R5, which I'm filming with lives in. Here, for example, I've got another one that I've got my binoculars in. I've got them for all of my lenses. I've got one for my flash here. Everything lives in a pouch and that way I can just compartmentalize and put everything in. I can fit so much more equipment without the dividers. So I think these are fantastic. That's some great tips. I never actually take all the things out of my backpack, but what I do, because I travel with so many camera bodies and there's no way I can get them all into my backpack, I actually use these Landscout camera bags and put like an R7 or my second or third R5 in one of these bags and then just put them in my suitcase, often like between my tripod legs so they can't really get crushed. But I feel like in this cover, they're pretty well protected. They also come in a million different colors, so that's pretty awesome. And while we're talking about protecting our gear, of course, lens coat, the name, we actually love the coats that they put on the cameras. With all of my big prime lenses, I've always like the first thing you do is you order one of those to protect it. It's gonna, you know, protect the lens in travel and things like that, but also for resale value. If you're ever selling your lens and it's not all scratched up like crazy, it's definitely a helpful thing that I think, you know, anyone who's been out in the field knows that most people have those on their lenses. And I think that's with good reason. Definitely. If I have my lens on the passenger seat in the car and I didn't have a lens coat, I probably wouldn't have any paint left traveling all those corrugated outback roads and stuff. So it's very helpful in that regard. Do you know what I've liked a lot lately that if you want to spend a little bit more money, it could be a great present for someone that's looking for a new tripod head. Is this 
Flex Shooter Pro head. That's really light, really small, super easy to travel with and has basically replaced all my gimbal heads because they're so much bigger, so much heavier. So having this small head that can still take a 600 millimeter prime lens, but wastes nothing and takes up no space in your bag. It's something that I really enjoyed using in the field. They're a little bit more on the pricey side, but it's definitely something that I really enjoy using in the field. Yeah, I wouldn't mind putting that on my Christmas list, that's for sure. <laughs> and yeah, and you know what else would be a great present for somebody? Would be ebooks or our pro sets or your masterclass. For anybody, any photographer in your life who you know would really want to improve their, their processing, or maybe you're looking at their photos and you're thinking to yourself, <laughs> they could really, they could really use to improve their processing. We've got the tools for you. Check them out down in the description. My ebooks, Jan's masterclass, pro sets, brush packs. Those are all great gifts to give to the photographer in your life. You know, there's another important aspect when we're out in the field photographing birds, especially skittish birds, and that's hiding yourself. So I know you and I have been using a lens called Lens Hide for many, many years. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the thought of bringing one of those big pop-up blinds or something like that is just completely impractical for unless you're like going to one specific site. You need a blind that packs down into a small little thing mm. that you can have in your backpack or your vehicle. And I don't use it all the time, of course, but there are definitely times with shire birds, skittish birds, or things where you want to just be more discreet, where it's so handy to have. And honestly, I can't really imagine having any other blind than the throw blind that Lenscoat offers. So that's a great product. And you mentioned the ground pod. You know, the ground pod is kind of like a hide because when you get down low like that and you're photographing shorebirds or ducks, you just kind of blend into the, the ground and the birds will come much closer to you. So it makes it easy for you to shoot in, in those kinds of environments. So those are two more great products that you can check out for yourself or maybe as a gift for someone. There's another thing I like to use a lot in the field and it's like these tiny little microfiber towels you can buy in like most outdoor stores. This one from like Sea to Summit and it's quite small and nice but you could actually use it to even dry yourself down if you ever fall in a creek or something like that or to dry your gear down in a heavy rain shower. So this is something that's definitely very useful. Yeah, that's a good one. And that actually reminds me of another little small little thing that could fit in a pouch like that is some kind of a bug net, like a head bug net yeah, because it's... definitely yeah, nice, exactly. So the mosquitoes can be pretty bad and you're always gonna be happy if you have a nice little compact bug net to have with you. It's also very good if you don't enjoy chewing on a mouthful of flies in the outback. There's one thing I know no photographer will ever be angry about receiving and that's extra memory cards, especially nice and fast ones. So I think a nice fast SD card, for instance, definitely doesn't break the bank like this 128 gigabyte ProGrade card. It's nice and fast. You can film with it and it will definitely give you extra space in the field. The only thing if you buy memory cards for someone else is that you need to make sure that it's the right kind of card that will actually work in their camera. And while we're on the topic of storage, you know, this is one of those things that's really changed in the recent years where you can get these amazing tiny little hard drives that are super fast, USB-C, and I noticed there was two terabyte ones like this for I think 130 Canadian dollars, like 100 US dollars. So pretty cheap and these are definitely like a must have these days for all, I would say almost all photographers. The only thing or a little word of warning I would say here because the Western Digital ones and the one that you're holding up there as well, the Zandisk ones, the Newer models or the latest ones all seem to have some sort of issues, especially on Mac computers. So hmm. currently I would probably recommend looking at the Samsung like T7 or T9, which seem to be more reliable in that regard. I had never any issues with these older style WD, my passport SSD ones, for instance. But if you look at the recent reviews on BHH, for instance, they're really bad. So that's the hmm. only reason I'd be a little bit careful, even though those drives are really cheap people had issues where suddenly all the data is just gone. So yeah. you don't really want that Do in your, your life. So I think if you want to be safe, the Samsung ones are probably the way to go at the moment. Good to know. I've never, for the record, I've never had any issues. I, I'm a, a Windows user and I've never had any issues with yeah. the SanDisk one. Just do your homework and make sure you get the one that works for you. 
And you know what else you might need if you have a fast computer and fast SSD drives? is a fast card reader like this ProGrade one. I really love it. It's definitely the fastest card reader that I've ever used. If you know somebody who loves photographing birds, try to find a really beautiful book of bird photos, something that will inspire them or that they'll enjoy looking at. Maybe a book about hummingbirds, for example. As photographers, we often appreciate looking through nice photos and that hummingbird book especially is a fantastic one to look through. Well, thank you, Jan. And of course, there's the ultimate present. If you're not entirely sure what to gift a photographer, there always is the gift card. I thought you were going to say cold, hard cash. <laughs> so we hope some of these rapid fire gifts gave you some good ideas of what you might be able to gift a photographer in your life. And we would like to hear from you in the comments. Is there some things that we missed or is there something that you love to give a photographer that we haven't mentioned? Make sure to let us know. Well, with that said, I think it is time for the rapid fire photo of the week segment. The first image that I've brought for us this week is by the bald headed warbler and this image is of this beautiful short-eared owl. Now, I really like this shot. It's a really nice photo. There are some things I could, you know, we could think about here. I've always thought when it comes to cropping and cutting wings, if I'm going to cut off part of the bird's wings, I want to make it a very decisive crop. So with that said, for me, if this was my image, I would crop quite a bit tighter, um, you know, very much just like a head and a little bit of the wings just because I think it would be more impactful as an image and it certainly looks more purposeful. Do you do you feel the same way, Jan? I agree. I think if you cut the wings, it needs to feel like you deliberately cut the wings and not leave someone wondering, did he just miss the wing? Should he have cut exactly. more? Did I want to see the whole photo? In most cases, it would be better to have the full wing in it, let's be honest, but it can work, especially with owls because they have the eyes on the front, right? If you get a tight headshot of an owl flying and it's staring right in the camera, that can be really cool, which could also work here quite well because there's this fantastic eye contact, those bright yellow eyes. But mm -hmm. I definitely agree. I would like this image to be more cropped in or be wider. If it's a bit wider, I would probably also slightly work on the background. But all around, a very nice image. The first image I brought is by Raoul's Wildscapes and it's of this totally sick looking snow partridge. And I just love everything about it. I love the browns and the feathers. I like the sort of black and white feathers as well, that bright red beak. And then I think it has a quite nice complementary background as well. Now, I don't know this species. I don't know if you do, Glenn. Is there any way that this black and white could be more black and white? Or does it have the brown or a lot of the brown undertones in the white? Yeah, I don't know this bird either. I was wondering, looking at the plumage, whether this is some kind of in-between in plumage. Mm. Like maybe they change from, like I, I think of or young birds in, or young bird. I was, that's what I was wondering. It doesn't, somehow yeah. it doesn't feel like full adult plumage, but I have no idea. The only other thing that I would say is as presented, I feel like it's just the head is too tight to the top of the frame. I think I would actually have had the, a little more breathing room at the top. The only thing I'm not sure about cropping more at the bottom, because then you lose those really bright orange feathers on the wing, which look pretty mm, cool. But true. I yeah. don't even think this is a four by five. Maybe I'm wrong, but yeah, there could probably be a little bit more space just at the top to balance it out a bit more. But overall, a pretty cool image. All right, the next image I've brought for us are some birds from my neck of the woods, these beautiful red-breasted sapsuckers by David Baker Photo. What do you think of this one, Jan? I think it's pretty cool. It's definitely a bird that I always wanted to photograph when I was on Vancouver Island. I think you actually took me to this spot near stream and we even saw one of them, but I just couldn't get a shot that day. They didn't want to play along, but it's definitely an awesome looking bird. And Getting two birds on one perch, especially woodpeckers on either side of perch, is definitely awesome. I know you brought this shot, but there's a few things that I would probably change, Glenn. Can you guess what I would change? Well, I think I'm going to guess that, you know, you're going to find those blue kind of specular highlights in the background challenging. I also think it would be ideal if the bird on the left had a slightly more of a head turn. There's something about the blue sort of highlights that I, I don't mind them on the right hand side. I think they flow really nicely. They give a lot of depth to the photo, so I wouldn't touch that. That blue patch on the left hand side right about the bird's head, I find it a little bit distracting. So I wonder if I would just tone that down a little bit or clone 
out some of the top ones so they're not sort of competing with the bird so much. And I would probably also darken down the trunk of the tree to make the birds stand out a little bit more because at the moment that's kind of brighter than the birds. So if you darken down that a little bit, I think it would make the birds stand out a little bit more, but overall a pretty cool photo. Yeah, and whether or not you'd want to do that on this image or not, that's up to you. But what is really important is to have the right tools to do it if you do want it. I think so often images aren't edited to a certain sort of standard or a certain look, not because people don't want to, but because people don't know how to. And so this is why Jan and I try to provide these tools. You know, we've got my eBooks, Jan's Masterclass, and we've recently come up with this brush pack. This is an ideal tool to do these kinds of selective edits. So for example, in this image, maybe you felt like the tree was a little bit too bright. All you would do is grab our darken brush and simply paint that in in the area that you wanted to darken that up. Maybe you wanted to desaturate the reds a little bit. You can easily do that. Whatever you wanna do, we've come up with our most commonly used selective edits and we've made a brush for them. So be sure to check out our brush pack down in the description. And if you wanna do amazing one-click raw editing, make sure to check out our pro sets as well. The next image I brought is of a cedar wax swing by Sudi4 and I just liked everything in this image. It's a nice background that gives you an idea that it's kind of in this berry bush. It, has, it sits on a nice berry branch as well. And of course it just grabbed the berry, throwing it up into the air. So all around a nice image. I just wonder if you added a bit more contrast to the bird, if it could help to kind of make the bird stand out more against these very bright berries and the bright background. Yeah, it's definitely got all the elements of a really nice photo here. You know, beautiful color palette with these sort of warm berries and the leaves and then the background, there's enough texture in the background to give you the sort of sense that that's probably the same kind of trees and stuff in the background. I think there's a couple things for me, if this was my photo, that I would have edited it slightly different. First of all, I'm not totally sure about the composition here. I feel like mm. this, this image doesn't need quite so much space on the right. So it feels like, it feels like it's kind of, everything's crammed down into the bottom left here. So I would probably either move the bird a little bit more towards the center or take a bit off the right. How I guess that's sort of the same thing. It also feels like there's a couple of hot spots. So right underneath the bird's legs, there's sort of a couple of leaves that are brighter, like maybe they're getting hit by the sun. I would probably, if it was me, also work on the neck there. There's a couple of areas of, whether this is in the fall and the bird's starting to lose a few of its feathers, um, personally, when I see birds, like, and this is such a personal preference thing, some people would not want to do this, but I always find with birds, if they're just missing one or two feathers, it really detracts from the image. And so if this was my image, I would clean up those few missing feathers. We've got a great new tool in Photoshop now, the remove tool, and that would probably make short work of this. Or of course you could use the more conventional cloning tools. So. I don't want that to sound negative because this is a beautiful photo and it has all of the right elements. I think just a slightly different crop and a few target adjustments. And this photo is gonna go from you know a nine to a 10 or an eight to a 10 or whatever you wanna say. That's the point here. These are the little things that can take the image up to the next level. I was definitely also looking at the bright spots, those leaves. I'll probably, as you say, darken them down or even remove them because they kind of just look odd with the sun hitting them. And here's a controversial one. Would you actually crop in so tight that you lose some of the berries at the bottom? Because I'm mm. not actually convinced that it helps in this case seeing the whole perch because the perch is kind of overpowering the bird. So I was thinking when you talk about the cropping, have a little bit more on the left, go a lot tighter at the bottom. So then the action of the bird becomes the hero and the perch is not necessarily sort of taking away from the bird, which is the real sort of star of the show. Yeah, this is probably an image where you could you know, play around with a few different versions of it. But I totally agree with you that for Instagram, if you think about this photo, what is it about? It's about this bird throwing up this berry and eating it, right? So we don't really need so much of the background. And on Instagram, where you're limited in your size, I agree with you. And we've been talking a lot about crops this time around, but the crop and the composition of how you're presenting the subject is so important. So it's really, it's really um, easy to overlook, but it's so important to the ultimate impact of the image. So definitely give how you crop the image some real consideration. Okay, so my final image this week is of course a bird family that's near and dear <laughs> to my heart. The challenging thing for those who haven't tried to photograph this species, you know, a lot of these hummingbirds, they flash their gorget for just a second. And this one in particular is quite difficult to get 
because it only shows from front on. Okay. So of course this is taken with like a multi-flash technique, probably using four flashes, and we can talk a bit more about the flash work in a minute. But the, the challenging thing is to see that gorget. So you need the bird coming straight at you and you need a certain type of flower and probably to position the flower just the right way. So this photographer has done a good job with that. I do feel like the bird is a little bit over flashed. Um, it looks a little bit, you know, when I try to set up multi-flash on my tours for clients, I really try to make sure that there's still some natural light and I explain, or natural shadow, and I explain to people that when you look at something, whether it's your hand in front of you or a branch or a bird, there always has to be a gradient of light from the top to the bottom. And if you look at this mm. image, what you feel like is that this image was illuminated all, of, all at once. It's just as bright underneath as it is everywhere. And that kind of makes it look very flashy to my eyes. So that's something that I would probably try to improve if it was my setup, but they've captured a great moment and certainly showing the bird very nicely. What do you think of this image, Jan? Yeah, it's definitely a great looking image. I must admit that I personally always struggle with these hummingbirds or sunbirds that only show the nice throat and the colors in the throats when they kind of look straight at you because normally I much prefer the sort of side profile where it feels like the bird's kind of looking into yeah, the camera, sure. engaging the viewer. So I suppose there's not much you can do it and they captured the colors here really well. But that's the challenge is some of these birds only yeah. show it straight on. And so you have to kind of think about how you could still present a pleasing yeah. image. You know, so that. knowing that, I think they did exceptionally well because they showed a nice blue in the tail, they showed the green on the belly and the wings, they showed a white sort of collar and they show all the purple in the throat. So in that regard, it works really well. I agree that it definitely looks like it has been hit too hard with the flashes, probably also because that flower is a little bit wet. So one really good trick here is I would do like a reverse curve on the flower. So I pull down the highlights and pull up the blacks, taking contrast out of the flower. And then I would also clone out all the obvious sort of reflections, the bright marks on the flower that would instantly make the whole image look less flashed. Playing around with the contrast and removing some of the reflections on the bird and especially on the flower will make it look less flashed. And for everyone who does know, if you do the multi-flash, you also have to use a fake background because otherwise the background would be yeah. completely black. So in this case, this will be a green, dark green photograph background that's pretty close behind the flower and the hummingbird kind of making it look like a real background. But I would also say a slightly lighter background might also take away from that heavy flash look because what we normally associate with a heavy flash look is a bright subject with a quite dark background. So I think even maybe lightening yeah. the background can also help to give it a bit more of that sort of natural feel. Or again, we can use the gradient and bring in light from like one corner, make the background, for instance, brighter on the top left and letting it go darker to the bottom right. Oh, there's a little visitor. I have a, I have a, a visitor on, on, our, <laughs> on our set today. Everyone meet Abby. Abby, get off. Get off. Get off, Abby. So in finishing that up, I think it's all about, especially in a case like this where it's a little bit heavy flashed, transitioning the light in the editing process to make it feel a little bit more natural. But now we dissed this photo so much, it's definitely an awesome photo that I would like to have. Absolutely, I think that's the thing. We wanna make sure that everyone understands with the photo of the week. We are not trying to like tear apart these photos and say these are bad photos. These are great photos, that's why we picked them. But there are things that you can do, and especially when it comes to the editing, to make them better. If you want, you don't have to do these things. We're not saying it's not a good photo unless you do this. It's just that, you know, from our eyes, and we've looked at lots of photos, we've edited lots of photos, we're trying to provide little tips that can help people if they want to, take them to the next level. So we hope you guys feel that way as well. The last image I brought is of this impressive looking stork billed kingfisher. I mean, it's a beautiful bird. It's a quite nice background. I just love the colors in this shot, that bright red beak, the orange neck, the blue colors, everything looks nice. It looks like it's definitely challenging light with sort of the bird actually being backlit, but it was still bright enough on our mm -hmm. side, sort of that the bird got enough light and colors on it as well. So all in all, really nice. There's obviously one thing that stands out that we would wish would be slightly different, and that is... 
Well, I the thing that I first noticed was I wouldn't mind more of a head turn. Yes. And the perch is okay. If it's a setup, if this is like a, a, a repeated site that the bird was coming back to, I think the perch could be improved. But this could be, that could not be the case. This could be like a once in a lifetime, it just landed somewhere. So mm. yeah, it would just be maybe the photographer had a whole variety of head turn options to pick from. And if I had one where the bird was turned a little bit more towards me, then I think that's that's what I would wish for. But all in all, it's a super cool bird, beautiful background, and it's a really nice shot here. And you know, if you don't like a perch like that, you can always go in with the liquefier and just give it a little bit more shape if it feels a bit too straight for you. Well, that wraps it up for this week. We hope you've got some great gift ideas from this episode, and we hope you enjoyed the photo of the week. Now, it's time for the giveaway, Jan. How are people gonna win the $150 gift card? So to win the gift card, make sure to leave a comment under this video with what you hope Santa is going to bring you. And then also click the link in the description with the instructions on how to actually win the gift card. So good luck, everybody. We hope you win the gift card. But do remember, there's a lot of scammers out there. So remember, we will never contact you in the comments. We will announce the winner on a future episode and we'll chat by email. So don't get scammed by those people down there in the comments pretending to be Jan, okay? That's right, and we hope you enjoyed this show. Make sure to leave us all your thoughts in the comments. Hit that subscribe button, and we will see you in the next episode very soon. Bye, guys. See you next time.